Hmm, what's this? Hello, welcome back to The Freak Show. Bumpy McSquiggums here. I want to thank you all for joining me as I continue with my Let's Play of Narborion Saga. I forgot the saga in the last time, guys. I, I'm sorry. In the first episode, I forgot to say saga. It's the end of the world as we know it. I know. I understand. It's it's fine. It's If you look at the main menu, it's Narborion Saga. Saga is real small. I, I don't know why. Whatever. Anyway, moving beyond, let's uh, continue. Let's see where we can go from here. We'll sit down and wait for the story eagerly. 200 years ago, in the moonlit halls far, far away, there was a peaceful valley called Actian's Grove. It took its name from the protector of the area, who was an ancient spirit of the woods, an Actian. Sure. It's probably like an, an Ostion or something, and I'm just pronouncing it totally wrong, which I do often, so just be aware of that. I know. I know. In the grove was a little chapel of Caddy Rose, the maiden of pleasure and blossom. Did you ever hear the name of Caddy Rose? No? Well, we are not surprised. Her cult vanished about 200 years ago. Or perhaps we should say his cult, because Caddy Rose was both female and male. She was... He... It... it they was... Were the daughter of Aeoli? Sure. A beautiful mortal woman and Zetan, the king of gods. She lived her mortal life as a woman and died in her 30s. She was as beautiful as her mother, which is why Zetan took her to the Cloud Castle to become a demigod as the maiden of pleasure and blossom. Caddy Rose asked her father for the ability to change her gender at will because she wanted to try the other side of pleasure as well. Her beauty astonished even the gods, and many of them courted her. Caddy Rose was gracious to all but one, Mordon, the self-made demigod. Mordon was a mage who possessed great power in his mortal life. He managed to reach immortality before he died, which makes literally zero sense, by the by. Although his necromantic practices took their toll, his body and face became disfigured so much that it frightened even the gods. Caddy Rose was frightened by him too, and the goddess would flee from him. But Mordon didn't give up. His hunger grew stronger day by day, and he pursued her continually. Caddy Rose switched her gender to avoid his or this unpleasant attendance, but Mordon was not disturbed by such changes. Finally, Mordon was finished with this cat and mouse game. His love turned to hatred. He sought only to punish Caddy Rose. To accomplish this goal, Mordon destroyed the cult of the demigoddess, killing and dispersing her followers. This warfare lasted for decades, but finally, the great evil accomplished his work. As a final desecration, Caddy Rose's chapel in the Acteon Groves uh, Grove was destroyed by the minions of Mordon only when he was able to catch Caddy Rose and imprison her beneath his tower. The princess stops, weighed down by the idea of this fearful crime. Her pause leaves a little time for you to comprehend the whole legend. Then she bravely continues. Now we ask you to travel to the north to the remnants of Akit Aktion. It's such a difficult thing for me to say. Aktion's Grove, as we know, its name today is Deadmore. Oh, lovely. There you will find the ruins of the chapel. You must repair it as best you can. Then, with the medallion you now wear around your neck, pray to Caddy Rose in the chapel. If you do everything as I tell you, one of Caddy Rose's shackles will fall down. Will you do this for us? You answer without hesitation. My faith and my life are yours, your highness. I will do my best to fulfill my mission. Then you have to act fast, my champion. The constellation of Swan will lose its power for a very long time by the next full moon. You have to find the chapel within 20 days, otherwise the protective force of the medallion will vanish and your quest will be well, a lot more dangerous. May the force of the Swan protect you. Alright, Carluna, Shatasha, and uh, Wadawan smile at you radi radiantly. In the next hour, you discuss the details of your quest. Before you leave, Carluna steps to you and places a light kiss on your cheek. You leave the room with your head bowed to hide your flushed face. And now it is time to prepare for your journey! Well, that was a weird legend. First quest achieved. Alright. After you finish talking to Carluna, you leave the Citadel and you go down to the city. You haven't got much time to prepare yourself for the journey because you have to start tomorrow morning if you want to reach your distant destination before the next full moon. 
It is late in the afternoon, so you only have time to look after two or three things before you ride out at dawn. As you walk down from the hill of the citadel, you begin to ponder on your opportunities and debate how to spend the rest of this day. You would like to say goodbye to your liege, Lord Kellinor. It is not only a polite gesture, but a necessity. If you leave without a word, your master will search after you, and everybody will soon have knowledge about your disappearance, or even your quest. Maybe it's not too late to visit Lord Kellinor, but you know that he likes to go to bed early in the evening. You need some equipment for your long journey, gear like that can, that you can buy in the stores in the streets of artisans. Life just begins now okay, at the end of the Three Arrows, but you have to wake up before dawn. So if you want to spend some time with your friends, it's time to go there now. You could go to the Temple of Zatan to ask for his blessing for your dangerous quest, although the Temple of Zatan, or, or Zedin, is open day and night. The priests of the temple usually retire after the evening mass. So what will you do? You will get also good horse and harness from the princess. That's kind of a weird phrasing, but fine. If, anything goes, if everything goes well, you will be at the northern gate of Shirilon when the guard in the tower shouts the last night watch and the gate opens all right enter the city start your quest immediately we're gonna enter the city all right we can enter the bachelor's house or we can leave the city we are at the bachelor's house there we can go to the temple the the inn the the alley of the artisans okay or lord kellinor's place i think i'm gonna go to lord kellinor's place we're gonna enter there visit lord kellinor Okay, I would like to start the episode, but it doesn't look like I can scroll down far enough. Okay, I can still click it. That was a little bit weird. Alright, you face the Road of the Knights, the locale of the mansions of the Royal Knights and Champions. Kellinor's residence stands a great distance down the road, so you walk about half an hour to get there. Your master's dwelling is a simple two-story building. His wife died long ago. He had no children and has never amassed wealth or goods. Instead, he devoted his life to honor and to fighting for his king. You find the Lord in his audience hall, the largest room in his house. He is sitting by the hearth, or the hearth as some people like to call it, in an oversized, richly carved armchair, sipping his evening beverage. You know that after a couple of glasses of red wine, he usually goes to bed, so you have arrived just in time. When you enter, he looks up a little surprised and asks, Well, why do you s disturb me at such a late hour? You know I go to bed early, so this must be very important. Yes, my lord, you answer. It is urgent. No, it is urgent. Tomorrow at dawn I must leave you for a long time, for more than a moon cycle. I have come to ask for your permission and blessing. You must leave. That seems like either an order or a crime. Well, my young page, what are you ensnared in? Or ensnarled in, eh? Eh? You st stop suddenly. You took an oath to Carluna that you would keep her secrets. On the other hand, Lord Kellinor is your master, and he is a faithful protector of the house of Asparos. The princess's secrets will be safe with him as with you. At least you could tell part of the truth. Or what if you figure out a fake story to explain your departure? I will always tell the truth. You hear your father's voice in your mind and you decide to follow his advice. Maybe he is my lord and he is faithful to the house of the rain, but I took an oath, you think. I will spare some details for myself. Whether he is my master or not, I have to keep the secrets of my princess. Let's figure out a reasonable explanation. Um, well, can't we just tell him that I have undertook a quest and so on and so forth? Uh, spare some details. See, I, I don't want to out and out lie. Let's do this. Uh, this afternoon I had... Good, I think they've added that so you click it away and it no longer just disappears, which is nice. Or i just jumping the gun really quick now. This afternoon, I had an audience with Princess Carluna. She asked me to help her with a little task. In order to fulfill it, I have to depart, as I said. My princess asked me to keep her secret. I took an oath, so forgive me, my lord, but I want to keep my word. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Please do not ask the details. Your master listens to your words carefully, then he takes a sip of his wine and says... No. He says, well, if you won't, then don't. Okay. May I ask what I can do for you? Nothing, my lord, except please give me your permission and blessing. You've got it. Anything else? That's all, my lord. Now you can leave. Uh, you are going to the door when your master's voice stops you. Wait! Wait, wait, wait! You have got my permission and my good wishes, but not your salary for your service. 
For every month you have spent on my service, I have spared some coins for you. Come with me. He goes to the corner of the room where a hardwood chest stands. You follow him. He opens the lock and takes out a small pouch. It is not too much, but more than nothing. Take it and use it well. Your journey will be long and tiring, so it could be a good idea to visit my good old fellow Lord Melcom, who lives on halfway toward uh, Talantis. He will host you and keep you well, I'm sure. And now go. Take your money and go. Alright, I took my money and I ran. Um, I guess we're going to go to the alley of the artisans. We're going to enter the alley. The alley of the artisan, artisans. We're going to start this episode. Cool. You go downtown where the street of artisans can be found. The street is long and is a long and narrow alley. Along the alley there are two-story buildings. The upper flats are the homes of the craftsmen and the lower parts are their workshops. You can find workshops of blacksmiths, weaponsmiths, carpenters, weavers, tailors, furriers, uh, leather workers, stone mace masons, oh boy, stone masons, weavers, I'm oh, sorry, uh, alchemists, barbers, jewelers, bakers, butchers, cheesemakers, and brewers. That's a lot of people. You can buy almost any item in the shops, and you will surely find anything you need for your journey. Princess Carluna will give you a horse and a harness, but you will need weapons, armor, food, and other such things as well. You can also get some magic potions to use. How much money do we have? Looks like 131. Alright, well... I think we have our axe, and that's it. So we should probably go with armor at this point. But none of this stuff shows us like what we're equipped with. Skills, feats, main. Really, there's there's no equipment. I feel like that's not right. Huh. Interesting. Cool. Alright, not really uh, useful. Yeah, it doesn't... I'm like, I'm sure there's... Oh, there it is, backpack. Like, I'm sure there's gotta be some way... Um... We're gonna equip it in our right hand. Okay. Alright, wear that on our head. I don't think we need to use that. What is this? An ornate dagger. I don't think that's as cool as we're hoping. Okay, I think we're gonna go with the armor smith. Above the entrance to the store, the following inscription. Adama's Armor Workshop. The rear wall of the store is occupied by a large window through which the light streams in the, are in from the front yard and sheds light on the benches where the master's assistants are hunched over their work. Shelves and racks are set next to the walls in which armor vests, sword blades, knee pads, and greaves are placed. These pieces have been decorated by the goldsmith and engraving masters at the request of the various clients, and then they will be clamped and riveted together by the workers. Most of the armor is prepared on demand, but there are some pre-made pieces and other pieces that have not been taken by other customers. This is a, or There is an abundant choice, but it is all, it is all far from cheap. Welcome to my shop, dear sir. Out of nowhere, Master Adamus, or Adamus, it's Adam, Adamaz, uh, pops up with a gleaming smile on his face. He is wearing expensive clothes without a trace of dirt, burnt holes, or any other damage on them that would indicate that he labors over the workbench. He takes a tape, measures from round, from round his neck, and while he is uh, talking, he starts walking around you, measuring different parts of your body. Creepy. Our armor fulfills every need. We have light and sturdy rhinoceros armor, okay, and even cold-forged adamantite full plate. The latter can only be made if you order it because the raw material is very expensive. If you would like, I can give you a small discount. Or are you more interested in ready-made armor? Well, we also have those. You can choose any of those that are in the stands except for the one in the corner because the customer is coming for it tomorrow. He points to the full plate mail armor decorated with gold engravings. Do you want to buy a suit of armor? Maybe. We have 131 gold. I think we have a hat already, so we can get some of the other stuff at this point. I don't know if our axe is one-handed or two-handed. We already have one of those. 
so 42. Are these all the same? No, medium shield. A medium shield. A large shield. Okay. A breastplate. Attack roll penalty. Dexterity. Ch I want, I think, light armor. Yeah, I think that's going to be okay. Maybe. Well, hold on. This is what the hide. Okay, defense of three. Defense of two. Yeah, we'll buy that. We'll buy the gloves too, I guess. Light gauntlets. And then the shield. Two, and then this is gonna be three. I'll go with the small shield too, why not? All right, so we bought some stuff. I'm totally cool with all that, I guess, I hope. All right, let's leave the shop. And I believe we can actually outfit ourselves at this point. Okay, so we have pretty much everything. So our defense is increased by, is it just one? That doesn't seem right. Oh, it's per thing, okay. So our dexterity is lowered by one, our defense is increased by two, dexterity is lowered by one, dexterity is lowered by one, okay, damage. All right, that's cool. All right, I see how that is. Um, what does a soothe sayer? The small silver bell that hangs above the door signals the arrival of a customer to Madame Lefleur's shop. As you enter, you step into a dim, narrow, and little room that is filled with the heavy aroma of incense. The walls are covered with heavy velvet drapes that seem like crimson or carmine, but you cannot make it out as the only light in the room is from a small candle that stands on a round table in the middle. The candle is mounted on top of a man's skull, which is facing the entrance. In the dancing candlelight, it seems as though someone could be watching you from those dark, empty eye sockets. You wait a little, and then you clear your throat to signal that you have arrived. When that doesn't work, you say, good evening, but you don't get any reply. Nothing happens. You're ready to leave this place when you notice some movement out of the corner of your eye. Across the room in the corner, drape, the drapes part, and a lady enters. Her face is hidden by a veil, and you can only see her warm, black eyes. Her dress is made from heavy silk, and it rustles mysteriously with every move. It is almost as if she is not walking, but gliding to the other side of the table, where she sits in the high-backed velvet armchair that stands next to the table. Her eyes are fixed on you, and her hypnotic gaze gives you the uncomfortable feeling that she is reading your thoughts. For a while, you both check out or each other out, and then the lady signals for you to sit down and addresses you in a deep, resonating voice. The way I see it, you are go about to go on a long journey. It is a wise choice that you have come to seek counsel beforehand. How can I help you? Uh, do you like to know what lies ahead of you, or do you seek magic potions? I can give you healing potions, filters, or f filters, fil filters, I guess, I don't know, that can win ladies' hearts, or potions that can take curses off of you. Tell me what you desire. Eh, nothing. I guess we're, we're good. Let's, let's leave the alley. Um, let's go to hang out with our buddies. Alright. That's weird. Oh, we have system messages and stuff. That's interesting. There's chat, which is strange, but fine. The three arrows in. Cool. Let's start this episode. The Inn of Three Arrows is not the biggest tavern in the city, nor the most famous, but pages and squires meet here. It's kind of a tradition. If a page has a little free time, well, he spends it here, that's for sure. If you want to say goodbye to your friends before you leave, this is the place you have to be. The Three Arrows is near the city market. The market is closed, so the only patrol the city guard, of the city guard walks up and down along the tents and stands of the merchants. But the liveliness of the inn never ceases. Most of the lords give some free time to their pages after dinner, so everybody you want to meet is here now. As you enter the room, you are greeted by a, the babble of voices and the smell of sweet ale, which is a speciality of the house, or the specialty of the house. You go straight to the bar and ask for a mug of ale, then you look around. At the fireplace, a slim, handsome young elf is getting ready to perform tuning his mandolin. You like music, especially the song of elves and ballads. Maybe you will listen to it. At a table in the corner, you see a man wearing strange clothes. He could be a merchant or a traveler arrived from a far land. 
It does seem like a wise idea to talk with him. Maybe he knows something about the region where you plan to go. Your happy fellows are sitting around a long table in their usual place at the other end of the tavern. They haven't yet realized that you've arrived. Near their table, it, there is a closed door which leads to the club. The club is a special service place where you can meet important people, make business arrangements, pick up the most recent gossip, but you have to register first. On the other side of the door, some men are gambling at a big round table. You could try your luck. All right, let's listen to some music, talk to the stranger. Hello, my friends, or leave the inn. Let's talk to the friends. Let's talk to the stranger. With your cup in hand, you step to the table of the stranger. Good evening, sir. May I join you for a drink? The stocky tan man looks up at you and nods shortly. You sit down in front of him and he signals to the barmaid to bring you a mug of ale for you. You listen for a while and observe each other in silence. Your companion is a man in his 40s. The garments... Fashion is not of uh, Sharonadonian. Eh? Eh? I have no idea if I, I said that right, but it's fine. But it seems to be very practical for journeying. He must have arrived from a far off place, so he may have some news and information which could be useful to you. Finally, you decide to start a conversation. I am Wisely Wexland, page of Lord Kellinor, if you know him. Would you be so kind as to tell me your name and where did you come from? My name is ba Balladur. Son of Ebelin. Sure. Balladur, son of Ebelin, uh, if you know him. And I come from the north. You hope some beer will make him become a little more friendly. He is your man. Okay, creepy. He came from the north, from the regions where you plan to go. And what's up there? Your companion glances at you with a strange look. Then with a slight grin, he begins to speak. Well, I come from Yara, I guess. Yara... Actually, where I hope to do some good business, but the, that place has changed greatly. In past years, the roads were safe enough to travel on, even into the deeps of the country, but nowadays it's terribly dangerous. I have been robbed and lost all of my goods. If I hadn't managed to escape from that orc camp, I would surely be dead by now. Then the flow of Narn River. I had to give it a wide berth toward the east. But, don't think that was better. I didn't know that country enough, so I got lost a little bit and arrived at an awful place. As I learned later, it was called Deadmore. A pretty good name for such a place, but that eerie tower was the worst. I saw it from more than a mile away, but even from such a distance, I could feel the evil emanating from it. So I went around the moor, and at last I met a fine man who lives at the east side of that demonic place. His name was Ruderix, the druid, a guardian of the valley. He is there to warn travelers of the dangers of Deadmoor. But by then, those dangers were behind me. Ruderix showed me a safe way to Potwill. Sure. A friendly village behind a tremendous forest, which he called Wraithrart. Thrart. Thrat? Wraithrart. Thrat. Thrat. I, I got nothing. It's a weird sound. I'm sure it's completely wrong. But it's fine. It's all part of the, the charm, guys and gals. It's all part of the charm. From Potwheel, it was easy. I reached the royal roads of Talantis and took it. Tomorrow, I continue to my home. Uh, do you want to know more about the Dark Tower? Do you want to know more about the Deadmore? You thank for the conversation. Ah, Deadmore. Deadmore, that's an evil place. It's better to give it a wide berth. People say that nobody comes out, of, out from there alive. It is a wide valley between two chains of hills. From the tops of those hills, you can see crooked trees, gray soil, and some strange yellowish fog above the floor of the valley. Ruderick said it is poisonous. I don't know, but when a breeze emerges from the valley, you can sense a decaying foul stench. The druid also said that the valley is even worse during the night because the living dead lurk among... Wow, this sounds like a terrible, terrible choice for me to go on for my first adventure. Uh, living dead lurk amongst its crooked trees. And Potwill, they showed me a pheasant, pheasant, a peasant, who, who is said to have survived a night on the moor. By the end of the night, his face had been torn off. Lovely, he wore a sack on his head with two slits for his eyes, a nun for his mouth and nose. And he reeked from the foul stench of the fog. Another peasant spoke of two huge bat-like creatures which took his cattle. They came from Deadmoor too. Yeah, th this doesn't sound like something I should be doing. Do you do you want to know more about the Dark Tower? Okay. Um... 
where are we at? Okay. Uh, oh look, my cup is empty. Maybe I spoke too much. Surely I spoke too much because my throat is dry. But if you give me another cup of ale, I can tell you more. Sure. Okay. Okay, so here we are. Well, when I was in Pod Podwill, uh, I saw an enormous wolf. Okay. The Podwillians told me that, <laughs> that the last winter was unusually hard and cold. Birds fell frozen from the branches where they spent the night. The wells of the village froze over, and they had to break the ice with picks and hammers. The trunks of the fruit trees were cracked by the frost. The animals in the woods starved. The wolves, foxes, and wild cats couldn't find enough prey in the fro frozen forests. So they started to come into Potwill to find some food. At the beginning, they didn't dare to come into the village, searching only at the end of the gardens. But as they became more and more hungry, so grew their aggressiveness. Finally, they were brave enough to walk in the village at daylight. Wow, that's creepy. One day, a dire wolf arrived in Potwill, and he even broke into one of the houses and took a four-year-old girl. Whoa! The peasants had had enough. They grabbed their forks, axes, and sides, and they went after the vermin. They followed it for two days and nights and found it in its lair. The vill villagers killed the wolf in a heroic fight. And they skinned it to take its fur back to Potwill as a trophy. Well, my friend, now it's late, and I've been on the move all day, so I'm tired. If you don't mind, I should like to retreat to my room to sleep. I will start early tomorrow morning. Anyway, thanks for the drink and good night. Didn't I ask about the tower? So why was he telling me about a wolf? That makes no sense to... Uh, whatever. Maybe I misread it. Thank you. Alright, so we did that. Uh, let's go talk to my friends. Uh, you go to the long table where your friends are sitting. They loudly cheer when you show up and make room for you at the end of the table. You sit near Brian, who was your training partner this afternoon. It is strange how long ago it seems. I feel like it happened in another life. Or in another episode. Eh? Eh? That trick, you know, what you performed on the ground? It was fantastic. You are the best of us, it's sure. Shouts Brian to you from the other end of the table. Hey, my friends, let's drink to Wisely Wexland, the champion of the parade ground. Everybody around the table stands up, they raise their cups and drink. Thank you, my friends, you reply. I'm here to say goodbye for a while because I have to go on a long journey. I cannot tell you more about it than or more about this for now, but I promise I shall explain everything when I return. If I return, you think to yourself. With these words, all of your fellows fill up their cups again. Stand up and finish their drinks in unison. As the evening passes by you and your fellows become louder and louder, and you feel you're becoming more and more tired. You try to retreat to your room from time to time, but your friends don't allow you to leave. You have to buy three rounds for your company before you can escape. Time to leave the inn. Alright, so we did three things. Do we wanna do we wanna head out now or do we wanna go to the temple? You know what? I'm not entirely certain, but I think this is gonna be where we break off the episode, folks. I'm not sure when the next episode will be, but we'll definitely come back. We'll play it some more. Uh, this time around, we didn't get to do any of the fighting or anything else, but we got to see kind of the city layout, the overview map, and there is going to be a world map where we actually make moves around to different places and we do stuff. And this game is going to be a tremendously huge amount of fun as we get through it and as we continue on, but but there's going to be a lot of reading. It's going to be lots of butchery of many words and many names in many places, so just be aware of that, but I hope you guys had fun, and I will see you next time with more Narborian Saga. Until then... My name is Bumpy McSquiggums. Thank you so much for stopping by The Freak Show, and I will see you later.